Right. Well, welcome. I'm Marcia Meskimen. I'm the director of the Institute of Advanced Studies, and it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome colleagues in the in the real space here at the IAS, as well as in the virtual space of, of the IAS today for what is going to be a, a double header seminar and a really exciting event for us. Um, we are welcoming two of our colleagues from Odessa today, from Odessa National University. Olga Brusilovska and Yulia Tarasuk. And apologies if I am not um, a wonderful pronouncer of your names, but I am hoping that is um, that is a, a good job. Um, who are being hosted by John Downing and Ali Bilchik today, um, and who are part of a much wider conversation we are having, and that has been ongoing for the last few months about twinning and being having a long-term relationship with Odessa. And we really are looking forward to this conversation today and to these two papers, but also to getting to know more about the um, Department of International Relations at Odessa and also how many links it has with us. And one of the things that just came up uh, a moment ago was actually how, how nice a fit it might also be to some of the work that goes on here in geography. So we haven't even begun to look at how many interesting relationships we might be able to build in the future. And we really look forward to that. It's my um, great pleasure to be able to turn over to my colleague John Downey to do a more specific introduction to um, both Olga and Yulia, but I just want to say on behalf of the IAS that this is a wonderful event for us and we are really thrilled to have you and we look forward to seeing you again at some point. So yeah. very much welcome. John. Speak. Yeah. Um, so my name is um, John Downey, and I'm a professor in the School of Social Sciences and um, Humanities. I'm, I'm also uh, president of an organization called the CREA, which is the European Communication Research and Education Association. And then we have three and a half thousand members um, who are communication scholars all, all over Europe. And so when um, Russia invaded Ukraine um, last February, I naturally thought, what are the good presidents of a prayer do in these circumstances? Um, should really contact our Ukrainian members and write them an email and express solidarity and ask what a prayer could do to help. So I wrote to our members um, in Ukraine, and one of whom was based at the Dresden National University, and she said, thank you for the message. If you want to help, get in touch with our vice director for international affairs, Andre, and see what you can do. So that's a good idea. So I contacted Andre and we had um, some initial email exchanges and Zoom conversations. Um, and I then spoke to Steve Rothberg, who was former PVC um, for research at, at the university. Um, and we decided it was a really good idea to try and have a twinning um, uh, relationship with the Western National University. The twinning relationships were organized by universities um, UK. And so we signed the twinning um, agreement with Desert. The Desert were very, very uh, keen on the idea as well in July last year. Um, and so far, we've done a number of things. We've had some teaching exchanges. A number of colleagues have, have uh, engaged in joint teaching um, uh, uh, arrangements. Um, we also had a research roundtable in December, which was uh, sponsored by the Ukrainian President's Fund, which is very uh, good. And, and together, we're working on a publication, um, a symposium publication, in the European Physical Science Journal. So, so that's something that's, that's ongoing. And as Marcia said, there are a lot of opportunities um, for other colleagues uh, at the University and indeed in the DESA to engage in twinning activities. Marcia, Marcia just mentioned that there's possibility of um, some collaboration with geographers. Um, I just had an email uh, during lunch actually from a computer scientist mm -hmm. who has just met with a computer scientist in Odessa to, to agree on what they're going to do. Um, so it all looks very um, positive um, and we have plenty, plenty of work to do um, um, between us over the next um, years um, and indeed longer, I think. So it's great to have Olga and Yuvi here because there's nothing quite like meeting in person for cementing relationships and developing a sense of um, rapport. Um, and I think we're convinced that we want to continue our intellectual collaboration with discussing ideas such as 
joint reading groups on theory and methods. Um, we're thinking about um, putting together a joint seminar series um, as well on, on um, the subject of disinformation. Um, because um, in the UK, it's very easy to think that the whole world supports um, Ukraine because it's, it, we have a consensus position in the UK. But that's not true even in the rest of Europe. Uh, not to mention Asia and Africa, and um, uh, Russian and Chinese disinformation is incredibly sophisticated. They spend a huge amount of money on it, and uh, in my opinion, the West hasn't really woken up to the threat, and it's about time that it did. Um, and so, um, for that reason, it's really great that Olga and and Olivia will be speaking to a certain extent about. Uh, about the importance of this information today in, 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 their, in, in, in their lectures. So thank you very much. I say to thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Masha. So, uh, OK. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, dear colleagues and uh, I suppose dear friends, because I feel him in Labra really like in the circle of uh, uh, friends, uh, it uh, was and uh, it was a very very nice time to be here with you. And uh, of course, we understand that uh, the purpose of uh, this internship is not uh, usual because we are in very unusual and specific situation of war. And therefore, I want uh, to propose you some observation of internal and external aspects of Russia's invasion. Um, but uh, I want to say that um, in my analysis, I try to show that uh, external and uh, internal consequences are inseparable from each other, this is first. Secondly, in such an audience, uh, it makes no sense to pile up facts uh, that you all know well. And uh, I would like to share only my um, thoughts and forecasts and, of course, get uh, feedbacks from you. And uh, I start from provocative thesis that, from my mind, uh, what the reaction on Russian aggression is still inadequate. What consequences it has and what even more challenging it uh, might bring in the nearest future to Ukraine, Russia, Central Eastern Europe and uh, other regions of what this is a question for me. And uh, I uh, start uh, from uh, Ukraine and several just points about um, e economic consequences. Uh, as you remember, the direct losses of Ukraine under war are already estimated at over 500 billion US dollars. And the economic consequences of uh, the war against Ukraine have already had a negative impact not only on Ukrainian, but also regional and global economics. And this situation may further deteriorate. Let's give only one small example of uh, bilateral level of relation Ukraine and China. Relation between these two countries developed slowly and did not go beyond trade and investment. The implementation of uh, signed documents uh, stalled, and after 2013, relation generally changed for the worse. Uh, the war after 2014 has affected China's uh, global and regional interests and uh, exposed its foreign policy to certain risk. China attempts to consider all the difficulties with the EU, Russia, Ukraine, and the US um, with neutrality. However, it has a notable, notable tilt towards Russia, which can be shown by the analysis of Chinese mass media. So until uh, the Russian-Ukrainian conflict is resolved, it's hard to talk about political cooperation between China and Ukraine, and the pause in this political relation uh, has affected economic indicators, 
including investment. Since 2015, the trade turnover between Ukraine and China has not exceeded uh, 18 billion US dollars. Previously, China was interested in many areas of collaboration with Ukraine and especially in military technical sphere. Uh, just example, Ukraine exports 90 million US dollars worth of weapons to China annually and uh, was the largest recipient of Ukrainian weapons. But the prospects of this cooperation are becoming very unclear. Uh, our strategic manufacturer of weapons, Ukr Baron Pro, uh, is now focused, of course, on ensuring the needs of our defense, which caused a reduction in the possible supply of military equipment to China. Besides, since early speaking, during the last 25 years, China has already received all necessary military technologies from Ukraine. But still, Ukraine is a big source of China's raw materials and food. And uh, Chinese investments are very important for Ukraine. Among them, in, in previous years, uh, were investments in Mariupol. Uh, China was the largest investor in Mariupol uh, because of, uh, first of all, Azov uh, metallurgical plant and um, Mariupol sea trade port. Bringing it under Russian control, on the one hand, blocked our exports. On the other hand, it harmed uh, Chinese economic position in this region. And uh, in the future, Chinese investors will have nowhere to return to. The city's factories, including Azov style, will be demolished because uh, they are unsuitable for reconstruction. So this is only one, as I said, small examples of uh, these um, consequences. Uh, for future of Ukraine, uh, war would have a, a long-term consequences. The deoccupied territories and cities affected by the bombings experience the first military heating season. Um, as you know, not everyone met winter with light, water, and heat. Thousands of homes have been destroyed and their owners do not currently have a clear answer on how and when they can get help. Funds uh, of the state budget go primarily to the army and uh, the restoration of critical infrastructure, not just homes. Uh, the world spoke uh, about their second Marshall Plan for Ukraine at the very beginning of the war, but it has not yet been formulated. So part the subject of political discussions is who will decide which projects to finance and how much money Ukraine needs. Uh, the president's uh, office uh, presented the concept of the Ukraine Reconstruction Fund, but this doesn't look like our version of Marshall Plan, because uh, there is neither a general concept nor, in fact, a plan. But this uh, plan raises uh, many new questions. I just uh, uh, give you some of uh, these questions. The first question is where are compensation and where is restoration? The difference between these two terms. Uh, second question, regional or centralized recovery model we need. Uh, third, uh, state or organizational institution of restoration. 
This is again absolutely opposite views on what these institutions should be. Uh, question four, who and how will select projects for restoration? Uh, question five, when and how will control these funds? And uh, the last, how long will the restoration of uh, Ukraine take? We don't understand it for today. This is just questions without answer. But of course, we should uh, go further and um, work with these uh, questions and find uh, the answers before uh, the end of the war. Uh, if we are talk about security issues, uh, we understand that Russia um, now and previously constantly raised the topic of the need to protect its security, which is threatened by Ukraine's desire to join NATO, and is discussing the issue of granting Ukraine a neutral status, but in light of Russian aggression, neutral statehood is not a viable option to maintain sovereignty and uh, integrity, territorial integrity of Ukraine. So uh, um, president uh, and uh, parliament of Ukraine uh, were looking for concrete proposals from the US and NATO on the way to NATO membership after 2013. Uh, we want a practical demonstration of the open door principle uh, with a concrete timetable for accession. Also, NATO is open to Ukraine and Georgia from 2008. Uh, we understand that uh, the US, as well as France, Germany, and other big countries are not prepared to set the terms for NATO's further expansion to the West, uh, sorry, to the East. In this context, uh, the Ukrainian government developed uh, some new ideas uh, to demand security commitments from the international um, community. And uh, very interesting and complicated questions. So what's uh, President Zelensky proposition that uh, the Budapest Memorandum 1994 uh, could be abolished. It failed, it could be abolished. By doing so, our officials uh, are announcing a serious interest uh, in development nuclear capabilities to discourage all the Russian warlike uh, behavior. But I'm not sure in positive reaction from the side of the West of us. Um, vice versa, Western capitals um, propose uh, this European civil protection mechanism. This is a very good idea. Thank you so much. It's very important because uh, it expresses solidarity with Ukraine. But at the same time, it addressed the symptoms, not the source of the problem, which lies in Russian aggression. Uh, and uh, maybe two small scenarios for future of Ukraine, the worst. For scenario, the event of the Russian occupation of a part of our territory, for example, southeastern or even central Ukraine. In this case, Western Ukraine would most likely become the location of our government, and uh, Western Ukraine would become a supply base. Uh, a basis uh, maybe for supplies from NATO members because uh, we have uh, four neighbors from NATO, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, and Poland. And uh, we would uh, return to uh, 
the Cold War period uh, when uh, the USA uh, and uh, UK supplied uh, anti-Soviet Afghan resistance. It might be the, the case of, like this. Uh, and uh, of course, more realistic scenario assumed a projected position of war, uh, the consolidation of the Russians on the left bank of the Dnieper and uh, on the um, borders of um, Luhansk and Donetsk uh, republics. But it is very hard to, to predict what will happen tomorrow. In what time, almost impossible to predict scenario for future. To sum up, uh, what, what, what I what, want to, to say to you, uh, if by this war, Putin wanted to pull Ukraine closer to Russia again, he has achieved the exact opposite. In terms of language, symbols, patriotic rhetoric, and self-esteem, Ukraine was never as Ukrainian as it is now. Maybe his advisors told Putin that if Kiev continues down this uh, patch much longer, Ukraine will be lost forever. This reason could easily be behind Moscow aggression against Ukraine, an aggression that at first glance seemed uh, completely illogical. But deep down, Putin must have realized that his political course toward uh, Ukraine has backfired tremendously. Okay, this is all about Ukraine. If we talk about Russia, we should understand uh, that if Ukrainians would be able to put aside uh, their competition with the West, they uh, could set their country on a less costly and much more promising course. But until Russia brings its aspiration into line with its actually very moderate capabilities, it cannot be a normal country. No matter what the rise uh, in its per capita GDP or other quantitative indicators uh, is. Uh, actually, Russia has none. No high GDPs, top-rated universities, financial power, or global language. Yes, it does possess a veto in the UN Security Council, as well as one of the world uh, two for most doomsday arsenals and uh, world-class uh, cyber warfare capabilities that do give it a kind of global reach. And yet Russia is living proof that hard power is brittle without the other dimension of great power status. However much Russia might insist on being equal to the United States, the US, or even China, it is not. And uh, it has no near or medium-term prospect of becoming one. And uh, a strategic, actually very important for Russia, slogan of strategic partnership with China, meanwhile, uh, has predictably produced little Chinese financing investment to compensate uh, for Western sanctions. And China has been building its own greater Eurasia from South China Sea through in Asia to Europe at Russia's expense and with its cooperation. This is a very interesting thing as for me. So um, Russia is a big market, but neighboring countries see risks in trade uh, with uh, this country. Uh, even Belarus and Kazakhstan see risks in partnering with a country that not only 
lacks a model of sustainable development, but also in the wake of its annexation of Crimea might have territorial designs on them. Mm. What Russia really needs uh, to compete effectively and secure a stable place in international order is transparent, competent uh, government, civil service, parliament, judiciary, media, a lot. Uh, but uh, all what we see the last years confirmed that Putin intends to follow the suicidal path for his country. What gives him confidence in his strengths? Uh, this is partly due to peculiarities of Russian society. Uh, the cons consensus in Russia that Ukraine is really a part of Russia meant uh, that uh, there was always benefit to Russian politicians in making claims on Ukraine and risk in accepting its independence. For example, it seems unlikely that Putin would have ordered the annexation of Crimea if it had not been massively popular in Russia. So uh, I am not sure that more democratic Russia, Russia without Putin may not have had more justice toward Ukraine and other neighbors. This is very important for me. Uh, and if I have, uh, I don't know, two minutes, I want to say that um, Ukrainian, Russian-Ukrainian war is of course uh, a regional crisis, but it is a regional crisis with global consequences that has already affected almost all countries and definitely all levels of international relations. Thank you. Okay, hello to everyone. And I want also to thank you for the invitation uh, to Lovera University and for this uh, very productive, fruitful uh, week uh, to us. I mentioned it before that to be uh, in this university atmosphere, I mean, to not in online format is very important for us because uh, uh, it's uh, past lots of time that uh, we have been to university all together. So uh, in these conditions of war, of course, thank you to you for this invitation. And uh, it's also uh, very interesting to be like in not, teaching, but in this uh, scientific uh, uh, area with colleagues uh, to listen to some new, uh, maybe, points and to get uh, some new information from you. And today uh, I am with, uh, I am with uh, one of my research uh, uh, theme, it's uh, Russian propaganda narratives in the Turkish information space. And uh, of course it's, uh, Big team. <laughs> I mean, it's not not maybe for one presentation, uh, not because of the case of Turkey or the case of Russian propaganda is my I mean endless topic to discuss, uh, and uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, we know that the there are uh, a lot of different parts and context of this uh, theme, and we have uh, previously uh, discussed and will be a will be published like a historical narratives of Russian propaganda in Tokyo. So why Tokyo? Uh, maybe because uh, uh, I'm also the uh, lecturer of Turkish language at Maui University at the also sphere of my interest, the Turkish foreign policy, the public policy of Turkish Republic. And of course, this information, disinformation, misinformation things uh, begin the part of our uh, research, uh, researches now um, because it influences on Ukraine at first. So we need to know it better, to show it better, and to be present in informational space uh, of you of Turkey as Ukrainians too, because uh, this place now is busy by other influ influencers. So uh, the uh, war of, in Ukraine uh, 
uh, has uh, exposed fundamental Russian narratives and historically based propaganda issues in Turkish internal policy and foreign policy also. Since more than one year ago, one year we have the beginning of full-scale aggression of the Russian Federation against Ukraine, Turkey reminds to be a country that considers maintaining partnership, partnership relationship with Russia and uh, also avoiding to uh, participate in world sanctions about it. At the same time, Turkey is considered to be a strategic partner of Ukraine, and we have special agreement about the strategic partners of Ukraine between Ukraine and Turkey, and it doesn't recognize the annexation of Crimea, of course, and uh, Turkey also has closed the Black Sea uh, Straits and was poor for the warships. And uh, Turkey supplies Ukraine with Bayraktars, uh, the main one of the main weapons which Ukrainians used against Russian uh, during this war. And uh, oh, Turkey was also very active in giving humanitarian aid to Ukraine. And of course, it was the main like uh, initiator of the Ukrainian-Russian diplomatic dialogue or peace negotiations. Um, beside the Turkey's own visions and goals in its foreign policy, Russian propaganda has, has also contributed to anti-Ukrainian and anti-American discourse in it. It also has reinforced the Turkish government's own propaganda pursuits and using its soft power methods uh, supplied the presence of cultural representatives and informational agencies of Russia Federation in Turkey. Um, the research is conducting with this question, how Russia has used its propaganda in media information campaigns in Turkish Republic, I mean big research of course, to, to influence the public opinion to and of course, how Russia used it to pursue its foreign policy goals related to the war in Ukraine. Implementation of the Russian narratives to the internal and foreign policy of one uh, country is usually been analyzing from the point of view of estimating the Russian informational campaigns in this country. Speaking about Turkey, we need to make one comprehensive and wide range research which contains the historical, political, and even ideological context at the, of course, at the domestic and uh, the uh, external level too. Despite Turkish government's increasing political, diplomatic, and practical support to destroy the territorial integrity of Ukraine, uh, one year in the war, Turkish media are still dominated by pro-Russian narratives and remain um, also vulnerable to Kremlin's uh, information uh, attacks. Um, Despite continuous political, diplomatic, and practical support from the Turkish government in restore, I said about it, and uh, but it doesn't mean that the society of Turkey, uh, Turkish society, and the government doesn't support Ukraine uh, in this war, but they have their own explanations uh, of the reasons of this war, and uh, see more, see it like mostly that uh, fight of Russia for new fair world order and uh, Ukraine is a victim in this war. Uh, and um, the roots of this widespread pro-Kremlin messages in the Turkish media are deeply connected to three main components. Uh, domestic political components, ideological view, and uh, historical background. Analyzing these three components, we can try to give answer to question why, meaning why it became possible at all in Turkey, and to give other answers to the question how. And uh, it's interesting that um, for these answers, it's maybe uh, sometimes enough to make a research and investigation of information space of Turkey, uh, because it shows the uh, main uh, public opinions and uh, sorts of both of governmental oppositions and uh, maybe this uh, 
not uh, popular political parties, but for example, they uh, have uh, a lot of subscribers in Twitter's accounts and a lot of fo followers, and they this and they just create the opinion uh, between youth. I mean, these Vatan uh, parties and this very uh, Czech Eurasianist um, followers. So speaking about anti-Western discourse in Turkey, uh, because it's uh, one of the most important uh, in the domestic political context, uh, we need to say that uh, the Turkey and the USA have long term this uh, crisis in relations, and the only uh, it's the only one from components which can uh, bring to together all the politician um, politicians from the government, from the uh, nationalists, maybe Islamists, maybe Eurasianists, and uh, other um, are the um, representatives of uh, political space uh, in Turkey all together because anti-Western discourse is uh, uh, the main thing that can bring them together. So uh, at the same level, like Erdogan uh, demonstrated this uh, attempt to be independent from the uh, Western position uh, in the, may, providing its foreign policy, uh, like the society also doesn't like this uh, American influence to their domestic life during the last 50, maybe 60 years. Uh, they blaming it with for, for the maybe this uh, 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 maybe for this Islamist uh, parties uh, in uh, their uh, last 20 years at for the uh, left part, left parties blaming for it, the other side blaming for the uh, supporting of Kurdish uh, Kurdish uh, you know, terrorist organization. So a lot, a lot of blaming uh, uh, to the USA. But this anti-Western discourse, what I want to say, it's very uh, big background for the Russian propaganda to be stayed on. So they even. <laughs> they even haven't need some uh, extra to make extra efforts to create this anti-Western uh, discourse in Tokyo. But it was existed there before, and uh, when it was started, they just supported this message that the um, supported this message that the uh, Ukraine is a victim of this war, and it's a, a game of the United States to. Uh, create new crises and take some advantages from this. So this idea uh, is uh, very popular and was in, I think, not I think, we've we made research in every uh, newspaper and uh, ch video channel of uh, Turkey. Uh, for example, I had a project with the students and uh, just uh, put the target words uh, to the different newspapers and TV channels during three months. And uh, we found that the Ukrainian crisis, even not war, <laughs> uh, Ukrainian crisis and uh, the United States uh, and the West, uh, you know, war of America, not of Russia, because war of Russia against Ukraine is not used like uh, together uh, in the newspapers. Uh, war of uh, America against Russia, it, at the same level, if you found it, it's more than uh, 1,200 uh, uh, findings in these uh, newspapers. And uh, comparing to the, for example, uh, like the, the same, like the if you want to find the uh, peace uh, keeping efforts of Erdogan's, I mean, at the same level, if you if you reading this uh, negotiation between Ukraine and uh, and Russia and Erdogan together is also at the big level. And I mean, all, only my dear friends uh, Putin uh, has a <laughs> better result in this investigation because uh, they. Uh, they are always together. It's uh, it's not president of Ukraine, but it's Zelensky only, for example. Sorry, for, I, I'll just explain it. Uh, and my dear friend Putin, um, or president of Russian Federation, Putin. I mean, it's also very important to create this public opinion. You know, it's just one guy, Zelensky, and this is Mr. Putin, my dear friend, and so on. 
So it's uh, very important also to understand. So uh, we talked that the Ukraine is a victim of US geostrategic ambition policy aimed to confirm the one polar <laughs> international order. And I need to, to uh, talk here about the president's spokesperson and foreign policy advisor, Ibrahim Kalin. He used to call the war of Russia against Ukraine as a crisis. I, I mentioned it not only him, but at first times it was all over the newspapers. And the main reason of it, mutual mutual mis misunderstanding of two sides. I mean, it's, the Russia wasn't shown as aggression, both at the level of government, media, and uh, maybe the some uh, journalists who made this uh, analysis at the channels. I personally participated to the uh, online uh, translation at CNN, uh, CNN Turk channel, and uh, no one time they use this war term. It's a chatishma, it's a conflict uh, and uh, mutual conflict. I mean, not aggression of Russia to Ukraine. It, at first time, it was like three months, it was only crisis. Okay. And uh, he also said that uh, this crisis leads to the new Cold War, meaning that Russia tries to fight against one polar system, international order, uh, as a US led unipolar system. I have some bones of it and uh, uh, so some articles with the same uh, context. And only in November, October of 2022, when the escalation period has started again, the rhetoric has been changed to the conception of not crisis, but wars, uh, and sometimes aggression definitions. At the same time, the war in Ukraine is definitely both positions as a war between West and Russia, still it's in November 2022. Uh, and uh, the quotation here, geopolitically fair war because all global and regional powers should be presented equally at the political world map. Here we go also to this um, conception of the regional policy of Turkey. Then the Turkey tries to make this ideological conception of region, big regional, big regional powers that could be um, presented uh, at the equal level with these big powers uh, of the world. So. Uh, Turkey was provided its original policy in Africa, in Latin America, in Central Asia. So they tried to do this like conception also of their foreign policy. And uh, they tried to, to explain even this war that the regional powers like Russia, for example, should be presented at the global map also. Uh, despite all personal peacekeeping attempts of the president of Turkish Republic, efforts for grain deal agreement, you know, it's, uh, it was in summer, closing by Turkey was forced for warships during last uh, years. Erdogan had been adhered to the position of interaction with both sides at the conflict and refused to choose one side. We had this famous quotation of it, it's impossible for us to give up on both, uh, on both Ukraine and uh, Turkey, and other politicians and other uh, governmental representatives uh, liked to repeat this uh, phrase, uh, starting all the conversation about Ukraine. I mean, <laughs> they say this phrase and then give the analytics, but of course, in the same um, position. He also has demonstrated the position of Turkey's own policy towards the Russian war against Ukraine without uh, any approval like or permission how to act of the NATO, of EU, and uh, he insisted on his separated, like his own policy position uh, from the West in this uh, question. Uh, it was also the famous interview when he said the uh, EU who would hold us uh, more than 50 years uh, at, at its uh, door, not given now and to enter to us, uh, don't say us how to act uh, against Russia and what sanctions to use uh, against 
to use or not to use these sanctions. So it's not the uh, organization who should uh, advise us to do. And at the time, given the permanent support to Ukraine, uh, his, he visited Ukraine and he uh, actually made a lot of conversation with President Zelensky. And he, he advocates in its territorial integrity always, he says, about these, um, it, its borders, so it should be um, the same like before the war. He offered the blame to West in this Russia aggression. And so uh, this is a translation, Russia, I will translate quickly. Russia is, an, is a, not an ordinary state, it's a powerful one. And of course, the West, especially America, is attacking Russia almost without limits against all this. Of course, Russia is presenting a resistance at the moment. It is quite late quotation, meaning not the beginning of the war. So this, what we know, know about the attack in Russia without any limits, of course, the consequences of the sanctions and these uh, weapons supplying to Ukraine, which uh, uh, Tokyo, not on the governmental level, but on the media and public opinion level, demonstrated against position against this supplying, uh, explaining that it's uh, the position that leads to the uh, escalating of the war and uh, conflict and only peace neg negotiations could be the reason of this, um, yeah, not the reason it could be the uh, one possible way to choose it. And uh, the ex experts of Turkish uh, foreign policy and our senior uh, diplomat uh, and good friend of us, Evgenia Gabe, uh, also says this nationalistic and anti-American anti rhetoric is not necessarily meant to be uh, pro-Russian. And so uh, what does it mean? It uh, means that the Turkish uh, demonstrates its own position in this uh, uh, con regional conflicts and security problem for Black region uh, on this for its own reasons. So we have this anti-Western, anti anti-American discourse. Okay, we also have our other domestic context to act in such way. For example, uh, economic crisis. And of course, government decided to use this uh, situation with war in Ukraine to explain why this crisis in Turkey exists. Of course, it started before the war, uh, <laughs> and we know it, uh, but all the nation, uh, it was easy for all the nation to think that war in Ukraine is the reason of course this economic uh, crisis. So it's better to finish it as soon as possible. So we don't need to, okay, guys, you're fighting for your freedom, for your territory, but your crisis is uh, what your war is, what uh, leads to the problem in the war. So you need to solve it as soon as possible. Oh, okay, it's time. <laughs> I, have, I have a lot of, okay. Oh, oh my God, it's put in small four pages here. Okay. So, <laughs> so okay, uh, I need to say something about ideological context too, but about historical narrative I mentioned before. Uh, historic narrative is not something uh, like lives, uh, uh, lives uh, only in the minds of these uh, uh, some people, but historical narratives is like big trauma for uh, Turks. Uh, meaning the Russian-Turkish wars in history, uh, and uh, in this war, in this wars, Turkey wasn't uh, a winner mostly uh, times. So they accepted uh, Russia as a very strong, big enemy. And you, what are you, what Ukrainians are you fighting for? It's Russia. You can't be a winner in this war. So this uh, exception of Russia is much as a big state is much bigger than in, in other countries, you know, in another nation. So uh, in Turkey, they don't like Russia, but they uh, think uh, about it like a strong enemy. And so, of course, after the uh, Ottoman, um, colors of Ottoman Empire the, and also of Russian Empire, they uh, understand each other like empires and uh, they need to act together maybe also now. So, uh, and also they believe in these territories, Ukrainian territories were the part of Russian empire. 
and some somehow they understand somehow they understand why Russia attacks. So uh, I really have a lot of information about the uh, uh, media, and even maybe I have one or few minutes. I think no. Yeah, it would be good to have an opportunity for a few questions. Though. Okay, okay. Uh, I'd ask you to ask me questions. <laughs> About <laughs> about other political uh, parties and ide ideologies like like uh, Eurasianism and the media uh, vulnerableness in uh, Turkish uh, information space. And thank you for your attention. Sorry, I was so uh, talkable. <laughs>